Hi, welcome to this Open Security Summit in July 2022. And we have Celine, which is going to talk to us about you know, zero trust in O2 in ICS systems. Over to you. Uh, hello, Denise. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for your time today. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really great to be here. Uh, and looking forward to um, yeah to watching all the other talks and then the panel on on Friday, which I'll try to make in person. Um, yeah, so we're here today uh, just to kind of to cover uh, zero trust, um, kind of in a way to demystify it really, because uh, I think zero trust can kind of mean a lot of different things. Maybe has lost its meaning along the way, um, and how you can apply zero trust as an architecture to um, IoT, but also especially operational technology. And industrial control systems. Um, so a little bit about me, <laughs> I, I kind of took a different spin uh, on the typical who am I that I used to always do. Um, so for any big Linux nerds, they might get that reference. Uh, so, so a bit about me. Uh, so I'm currently a security technical specialist at Microsoft here in the UK. Uh, previously, I was at uh, Carbon Black, which is an endpoint protection solution. Uh, that was acquired by VMware. Uh, before that, I was in, in VMware uh, core organization. Um, I've got a little bit of security operations background. That was when I pivoted into cybersecurity specifically. Um, and, then, and then I've studied computer science as well. Um, and then I kind of made a very, very corny uh, dad joke <laughs> of uh, how I have, I have a good long-term memory, but a very bad short-term memory, <laughs> a working memory. Uh, again, for any kind of big Linux nerds, they might get that, that reference. Um, so, so just before I get really into it, uh, do any of these sound familiar to you? Uh, the, here's a very famous example in, in cybersecurity, uh, the casino hack. Uh, so there's a unnamed North American casino that was hacked um, for a very silly reason, if you think about it. Uh, it was a sensor in an internet connected fish tank. Uh, and that is how the attacker got into the network. And then uh, let, was able to actually laterally move into other parts of the network to the point that they were able to exfiltrate, uh, I think it was at least, yeah, it was at least 10 gigabytes of data. So I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds a little bit like a film scene, <laughs> you know, it sounds a little bit like an Ocean's Eleven uh, scene, but, but this happened in reality. Uh, one of, uh, another more recent attack, so this happened last year also in the US. So this was a water treatment plan that was breached. Uh, so that so that was breached by an attacker and they attempted to poison the water supply. Uh, again, goes without saying, you can only imagine the, con the how bad the consequences could have been. Um, you know, if you think about, you know, what about the, the water supply for, the, for, for, for your end consumers? Uh, and so the things that were, uh, the, yeah, the, the things that, that were detected actually uh, was that there was a remote access. So that means there was a device that was that had remote access enabled, just like, yeah, enabled um, to anyone. Um, there were weak credentials involved. So in this case, um, in, in this case, it was a former employee who left, uh, still had the, the, the password. And apparently it was a password that was shared among many different uh, users. So again, that's, that's, an, that's an example of a weak credential <laughs> being implicated here. Uh, there was a lack of monitoring, so not being able to, to detect and not being able to see uh, uh, quickly enough that this breach happened. Uh, an outdated asset inventory, so meaning there were, the, this, organization, this organization didn't have a way to, uh, to have an updated uh, list of all the devices, uh, all their assets in the network, whether IT or OT. Um, and actually this, this uh, threat actor attempt actually raised the sodium hydroxide levels um, so yeah, th this could have been a really bad example. There, there are countless more examples I could go on and on. I mean, I think we've all heard about Stuxnet uh, about a decade ago. That's another example of a big, you know, OT um, um, uh, attack uh, malware right there. So, but let's just get down to basics. So, what is operational technology and industrial control systems? Uh, I think we have a good idea of, of IoT, um, but here, as, as you'll see, I kind of focus a little more on OT. Um, and there are, there are a lot of reasons why. Uh, one of them is that it's still kind of a part, it's still kind of a part in our industry where there isn't really enough security. Uh, I mean, same goes for, for IoT as well. You know, if you think about how many IoT devices come with a default uh, password that is never changed or, or, or how easily it is to find a plain text password, you know, um, yeah, IoT devices are very easy to, to, to hack as well. But here, 
let's define operational technology. So what does it mean? So it means it's the systems used to manage industrial operations. So whether that is hardware or software, uh, so it's the hardware and software that's very specific uh, and it detects or causes changes uh, all the way to the physical processes. Uh, it has to do with monitoring and controlling, uh, uh, for example, physical devices. So even opening valves uh, in an OT uh, state, you know, environment or, or pumps, controlling pumps, um, as well as supervising that data and calling that data back to a central uh, command. Um, so industrial operations, so it's, it's more about industrial operations management rather than the traditional and kind of more typical tasks of IT operations, which in our industry we might be a bit more familiar with. Um, so examples are uh, production, uh, manufacturing, uh, water utilities, mining control, uh, oil and gas refining and monitoring, uh, the electric grid, uh, medical implication uh, uh, uses as well. Um, so the reason why I focus especially a lot on IT and OT here is because there are still a lot of kind of differences. Um, there are different priorities uh, between the two and also traditionally they can be quite siloed. Um, so yeah, in summary, uh, OT has quite a, a different priorities and requirements. So if we think about the CIA triad in security, so confidentiality, integrity, and availability, when it comes to IT, we tend to worry, we tend to be more concerned around data confidentiality and privacy, around integrity. Um, it's more about that kind of security, right? And then whereas in OT, really what's mission, it's more about the mission critical. It's about keeping the lights on. It's about making sure that that conveyor belt keeps running and make sure production keeps going and manufacturing keeps going. Uh, and, that, and that critical national infrastructure keeps running. So it's more about the physical safety, the safety and the availability, especially. So availability is really top of mind to the point that security is has often been kind of more of a, you know, an afterthought. Um, there's also the issue that there's a lack of skills as well. So, so not every organization that has an OT environment will have an OT security person. Sometimes you just have one person that takes care of the OT and wears many hats, right? So, um, and then conversely in IT, it's it's similar. Um, if you think about a traditional security operation center with, with your security analysts, they might not recognize a OT specific, you know, vendor specific protocol. They might not, if they get, if, if they see an alert or if they see something with, a, with an I, IoT or OT security solution, they might not recognize or understand what it means or, or what it is. Um, and so, so again, there's kind of sometimes a, a, a lack of scaling or lack of knowledge between the two, and then they tend to operate separately and they tend to have uh, that kind of silo and, and not really working together. Um, but especially, and I think more importantly here as well, is the fact that traditionally OT environments in the last couple of decades, when, they're, when you think about an OT environment that was built maybe 20 years ago uh, and has a lot of legacy OS, um, it wasn't made, it, it was made, it's actually quite brownfield now. So there are some environments that are very brownfield, meaning there's a mix of old and new. Um, there are some uh, very old OSs that no longer support patches that, that are no longer supported. Uh, so there's, there's quite a lot of vulnerabilities there. Uh, but, but when that environment was made, it wasn't made thinking at the time, oh, someday this will connect to the corporate IT environment or someday this will connect and there will be more traffic between the two. Uh, or potentially that could happen. Um, nowadays, we see more and more OT assets that are open all the way to the, to, to the public internet uh, or that have connections all the way to the corporate traditional network. And then, and that's where traditional uh, I, um, security uh, IT issues, uh, like, like, like let's say a, a typical malware or not Patia ransomware or something could actually pivot and get into the OT uh, environment. So, so really, in essence, it's, it's, these are kind of like the main differences between, between the two. Now, with the increased uh, attack surface, uh, you know, ever expanding with, with increased amounts of IoT devices everywhere and with the increased uh, uh, OT devices are connected, um, we have to think about that visibility, uh, having a visibility of that and being able to monitor that. So when it comes to IoT specifically, so this is just to kind of show the differences uh, in, in a visual way. So on the left side, you've got uh, your OT uh, device, uh, devices. So, um, so for example, programmable logic controllers, which tend to be very kind of microcontroller based, that can be reprogrammed. Uh, your industrial automation, uh, your embedded, there's a lot of embedded systems there as well. 
Um, there's a lot of proprietary equipment with like vendor specific protocols that could be, you know, that, that are often different than, than your traditional protocols. Um, and IoT is more about the, 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 the connected sensors and thermostats, smoke alarms, you know, like those sensors like in the, in the casino <laughs> fish tank hat, uh, hack. Um, it, this also, so IoT can also comprise uh, IoT in the enterprise, so in the office. So, you know, think about, you know, is there a smart TV that's in the, the lunchroom? Uh, is there um, IP cameras, uh, et cetera? And then all the way to the edge as well. So ATMs, uh, gas pumps, uh, point of sale uh, systems. And so here's just a little breakdown, <laughs> a little acronym breakdown. Um, so the reason why I made this slide is because when I first started getting interested in operational technology, I was getting quite confused uh, about the terms. There's a lot of different acronyms and terms like SCADA, ICS, you know, what does it mean? What are the differences? Uh, I'll just do a very quick summary. Uh, so ICS is more, uh, so ICS is a subset of operational technology. Um, so that encompasses then the computing systems that manage these industrial uh, operations uh, rather than the administrative operations of IT. Um, so industrial control systems, again, high availability is, is like the main requirement. It's about mission critical. Um, SCADA is then a subset of ICS. So SCADA, we often hear about SCADA if you kind of, you know, if you search into this. Um, so that's more about, um, that's, that, that stands for supervisory control and data acquisition. And so what that means is that um, it actually so kind of essentially the way it works, so it's a systems architecture for managing large and complex processes, um, often found in utility providers like natural gas uh, or electric power transmissions. Um, so SCADA is where control functions are distributed. They tend to be distributed over a large uh, geographic area. Um, so uh, typically consist of, of uh, three main components. So the, the central command uh, center, uh, so that's where you'll have the central command, you know, servers that run the SCADA software. And then multiple remotely local uh, control systems that then directly control and automate process equipment. And then you've got comms systems as well, so communication systems that connect the servers at the central command uh, center to the remote locations at the edge. Uh, and so the main purpose of SCADA really, it's about acquiring that data um, and supervising. So, so the network then consists of multiple remote terminal units uh, that collect the data um, and then collect it back to the central command center so that the SCADA system can make a high level decision. So yeah, so that, that was quite, <laughs> quite a bit of a, a, a deep dive there. Um, and when it comes to SCADA, then you've got another subset um, uh, in, in D, uh, DCS. So, so most industrial control systems, uh, they'll, they'll typically fall into either uh, continuous process control systems, um, often managed by PLCs, so a programmable logic controller, or, or a DPC. A D, DPC is a bit, a bit different. Uh, it could use a PLC or another batch process uh, device. But here we'll focus more on PLCs because um, I'll go a bit more into that uh, later on. Um, and so the way that a programmable logic controller works is um, so it uses a programming language called ladder logic. Uh, so programmable logic controllers, um, they take care of the continuous or the discrete process control systems. Uh, so they're used in industrial automation. Uh, they can be reprogrammed per use case. Uh, and actually in some cases, if not careful with it, uh, there have been cases of PLC devices haven't been found to run code as root uh, or to, or, you know, to have other kind of kind of uh, risk um, found there. Um, ladder logic as a as a link, as a programming language is quite interesting because it's you know it's, it's different than your typical programming language. You know, it's 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 not an object oriented language. Uh, it's I, I've looked at it myself and, it, and it's quite interesting because it's more based on the circuit diagrams and relay logic. Um, you know, in, in hardware or, or electronics, uh, and so PLCs then what they can do, um, yeah, they can do things like open valves and control control yeah control things uh, in, in that industrial automation. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to. I just had a quick little poll for you guys, uh, <laughs> uh, if you can. Um, I'm just going to take a moment as well because I think I see something in the chat. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, PC deals with hardware. Scada is more software oriented. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Abbas. Yeah, that's a good point. That's true. Yeah. 
Yeah, so SCADA is, is, is about the software and then PLC is, yeah, a hardware-based tool. Sorry. Um, yeah, so just, just a question then. Uh, so if you've got a chance to go to menti.com and put the code 40578991, and then, um, and then you'll be able to to then answer this question, or you can answer in the in the chat in the Zoom chat if you prefer. Just to kind of get an idea of if you have any IoT devices, uh, what have you got in place? <laughs> what have you got? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I've got one as well. Does it does a Lex account? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. And I actually, I, I do actually have one. And I'll be honest, because of my security hats, I'm, I get a little scared. And I, and I've I've been told, you know, I think some companies tell their employees if you have an electric in the room, like, move it out of the room when you're in, in, in meeting, you know, just in case, or just yeah. Oh wow, yeah. Oh yeah, ring doorbell. Smart TV echo show. Yeah, th thanks everyone. Wireless printer. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I'll just give it another minute or so, and then thirty seconds. Sorry, uh, I'm stacking at the moment, so I cannot add mine. But on my one, I got a boiler, and I got an Alexa. Ah, okay. There you go. <laughs> yeah, thanks everyone. So. Then if just going back then, um, so then let's think about the importance then of securing uh, IoT uh, and OT. Um, so what we found, uh, including uh, a Microsoft way of work, uh, but just industry-wide is that it's it's also now become a business concern. And I mean, that's, that's quite obvious, but at the end of the day, you know, security is about, um, it's about securing society, it's about securing organizations and, and, and how can we enable and empower business uh, to, to to be secure and, and, and to do business better, uh, and so so obviously what we found then is that digital, the, the increased digital transformation and especially the last couple of years since the pandemic, uh, and then especially with increased amounts of IoT and, and connections and interconnections uh, have significant significantly expanded the attack surface. Um, you know, and then also we have to think about the fact that adversaries are more motivated, whether it's motivated uh, financially or uh, or, geopol or politically uh, and, and other reasons. Um, and there are, there are actually you know, targeting uh, OT environments and th there's OT specific malware um, that exists. Um, and then, and then another big trend is the fact that security operation centers uh, tend to not have visibility into their IoT and OT risk. And so that's another really big, uh, big key risk there. Um, some other things around IoT and OT risk. Um, so also based around what we've seen in the industry um, is a financial impact. You know, it goes without saying, if, if, if you've got a malware shutting down a factory uh, that can cause billions of dollars in losses, um, whether it's one caused by WannaCry, not Patia, um, or um, or pipe dream or you know other OT specific uh, malware, um, and then of course IP theft. So if you're especially if you're a manufacturing organization, you have to worry about how do I keep my my proprietary formula or blueprints or designs uh, secure. You know there's there's a risk of cyber espionage um, uh, going on, and and that's where um, focusing on on on, on IoT and OT. Um, uh, attacks, uh, yeah, that, that's how that's how they could do that as well. Uh, and then we have to think about safety as well. So especially when we think about critical national infrastructure, uh, things like keeping society going, keeping the electrical grid uh, running, uh, water utilities, um, uh, yeah, just just everything within CNI can be can be affected there as well. Um, so this is a global IoT and uh, industrial control system risk reports. Uh, so this came from vulnerability data from over uh, 1,800 uh, ICS networks. So this came from CyberX, uh, which was then later um, uh, acquired by Microsoft. But yeah, so, so CyberX had seen that among those almost 2,000 uh, ICS networks, um, almost three quarter of the sites had outdated versions of Windows that no longer receive security patches. 64% uh, have unencrypted passwords. So again, you know, it goes without saying, that's, that's, that's quite bad. 
66% were not automatically updating Windows uh, with the latest antivirus definitions. Uh, more than half of the networks had ICS devices with remote access enabled. Um, and then just over a quarter uh, had ICS devices with direct connection to the internet. So again, this is quite a big difference compared to OT um, previously, which was, which was less connected. Um, and here's an example of an attack uh, on a petrochemical facility. Um, so in this case, uh, an adversary uh, leveraged uh, living off the land uh, techniques. So meaning uh, using existing software tools that are, that are legitimate within the environment. Uh, so using existing uh, known good um, um, uh, applications and, and, and other things. So what happened in this case was that the attacker stole OT credentials uh, from within, uh, from the corporate network, and then was able to actually pivot through the demilitarized zone, uh, and then crossing over into the OT estate um, through remote access uh, from IT to OT network. Um, just for information, you can see here the different layers. So L4, L3, etc. Those refer to the layers uh, of the Purdue model, uh, which is a model that's specific to ICS. Um, and then down to the layer two, so that's where SCADA uh, reside. Uh, and then, and actually pivoting then, well, moving actually. Um, and actually there was a, a tri-station uh, protocol um, uh, used there. Uh, and actually this attacker was able to reprogram the safe, uh, uh, reprogram a safety um, uh, PLC um, and so what it did is they, they use a standard PLC logic update function that OT engineers tend to use themselves anyway. So in and of itself, it's okay. But in this case, you had an attacker do it, you know, for the wrong reasons. Um, and then actually this attacker then actually tried to affect the sensors and actuators and tried to disable the safety PLC to, to try to launch another cyber attack. So in this case- so what, what, what was that term you used? Living off the land? Yeah, it's a term in cyber. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a silly term. Um, sometimes it's called uh, a file less attack or lol bin. Living, living. Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah, it's basically like as an example, I imagine that I use PowerShell and, and, and uh, uh, or, or imagine that I use, you know, just kind of known normal software, uh, but, I, but I use it to kind of to, to, to launch an attack or launch a script and then, and then uh, invoke something else or uh, but yeah, so so basically, it's without using. Yeah, no, it's cool. It's, it's actually not a bad term, right? It just means you use whatever's there, right? So, yeah. <laughs> cool. Sorry, no, really cool. All right, continue. Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, so I think it goes up saying the you can kind of imagine the worst case scenario if the um, attacker would have been able to actually do something really bad that could have then affected the cyber, you know, beyond the cyber and into the physical. Which you know could potentially affect human lives um, and and safety, right? So so now then, enough about <laughs> about OT uh, and things like that. But right now let's pivot to zero trust. So you know again, I don't know how you feel about zero trust personally, um, but yeah, it, it tends to be seen as kind of a marketing uh, marketing buzzword these days. Um, but yeah, we'll, we'll get we'll get into that in a minute. But now, just I've got another mentee meter. If you still have that window open, you can actually you'll actually be able to. There you go. So if you still have the mentee window open, and if not, you can go to menti.com and use the code four zero five seven eight nine nine one. Um, so my question here, because I'm I'm quite curious, and don't be afraid to be as brutally honest as you feel comfortable in a recorded video, uh, but what do you think when you hear or read the term zero trust? Like what, what comes to mind? And I'll, I'll just give it a, a minute. Ah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's an interesting one. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, the blocked access strikes me as interesting because in one way, it's a good thing. Well, it can be, you know, it's a good thing when needed, but
But on the other hand, you don't want to you don't want to have so much security in place that it hampers, you know, that it affects the end user experience so badly, and that you're actually blocked from doing you know doing your your your, your job. So that's where you have to we have to think about the end user as well about how do we empower uh, people to actually do their jobs or, or or live without security getting to getting in the way. So how, how do we how, how do we handle that that balance of we need enough security but at the same time we also need to to enable things to you know and enable people to do to do their best. Yeah, buzzword. Yeah, definitely a good one. Use privilege. Yeah, that's good. PKI. Keys and certs per device. Oh yeah, that's good. No central trust authority. Validating every connection. Yeah, that's pretty good. Root trust. Assume breach, yeah. <laughs> I like the one being exploited by sales. <laughs> oh wow, yeah. No, I I hear you. Yeah, definitely. More flexibility, yeah. Yeah, that's the that's the problem, right? Well, so so basically, I'm just going to switch back to the to the slides then. So, yeah, and and I mean, I yeah, that that I, I think that was a really good work cloud. That was really qu quite well summed up. Um, and, and good to hear your thoughts. Um, but really, what's interesting, what's interesting about Zero Trust is that even though, okay, maybe marketing has co-opted it and, and it's lost its meaning along the way uh, over time, uh, really originally it actually, so it, it actually originates all the way back to 94 in uh, Stephen Marsh's doctoral thesis on computer security and trust as a concept. So interestingly enough, it was about trust, not only in, 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 in IT security, but also um, from a sociological or societal aspect. Um, so I don't know if you're aware of the open group, uh, but it's the open group is really great because uh, it is a vendor uh, agnostic and industry uh, open um, group around uh, improving uh, security and kind of coming together to, to establish some, some security guidance and, 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 and frameworks. Um, so there used to be a part of the open group called the Jericho Forum and that opened up at the time to work on something called deep, the deep perimeterization of the network. So meaning going away from the traditional, the network is the perimeter. And you know, once you're in, once you're inside, it's trusted. And kind of going away from only looking at the perimeter, right? So because that can that tends to be more the tradition in, in, in security, but but there are quite some flaws there. And so rather than focusing on only network-based perimeter security, they wanted to uh, the open group and Jericho Forum wanted to improve that. Um, later on, and so that they then kind of, uh, they then start using zero trust and, and building on that. And then in 2009, uh, Google then released their implementation of zero trust architecture uh, uh, in something called uh, in Beyond Corp to create a zero trust network. So compared to traditional VPNs where, where for example, you connect to VPN and that's it, you're in, uh, Beyond Corp considered both the external and the internal network as not trustworthy. So as untrusted before granting the access based on uh, device, uh, state and, and session and user contextual information. And so, so kind of like in a conditional access sense. Uh, and, and that of course is, is important. So, so Google then had, had started to do that work. Um, but really kind of in, in summary, so what is zero trust? And I mean, this is a very base, base, <laughs> basic sort of uh, summary, but it's a security model of architecture that describes uh, in, improved approaches to the design of systems. Um, initially, historically, it was aimed at looking at beyond the network as the perimeter. Um, in a nutshell, it means don't trust, you know, never trust, always verify first. So always verify continuously. So verify everything explicitly rather than implicitly. Uh, so for an example, you know, just because Celine's user, you know, Celine logs on to this laptop, even from another country that I've never logged on to out of nowhere, it doesn't mean that you can trust that it's me. You know, you want to look at the contacts, you want to, to look at the risk. Um, it's about also authenticating and authorizing before a session to a resource is established. Uh, and then it's also looking at beyond the network segments and looking at all the resources. So protecting assets, devices, services and workflows, uh, network accounts. And actually something really interesting is NIST, uh, 
so NIST in, in the US, they've come up with a zero trust architecture uh, tenets, so kind of like commandments. So this is this is just you know a brief summary, but you can read a lot more into it in the link below. Um, and actually, interesting, interestingly enough, uh, the NIST SP 800-207 that was actually cited in the executive order from uh, from the U.S. president last year, uh, where they they mandated that uh, zero trust architecture be implemented, uh, and that um, and that it should be used in OT, that it should be considered in OT as well as IT. So kind of kind of an interesting piece right there. Um, and the reason why is because of the obvious that we know that OT. Um, and you know it, it is increasingly uh, something that, that we need to protect uh, and secure and have visibility of and, and that zero trust you know is, is relevant and, and can help you know it's still relevant and can help. Um, so the tenants then just as a summary it's all sources and computing services so so all of these are resources all communication should be secured regardless of the location. Um, so access to an individual resource should be granted per session. Um, and then, and so again, that goes back to that continuous uh, kind of verification. Um, access should be determined by dynamic policies. So policies uh, that look dynamically uh, regarding looking looking in terms of context and behavioral analysis as well. So, so is, is this a typical behavior or, is, or does this go off the baseline? You know, looking at the client identity, looking at the app and service, looking at the requesting assets, the behavioral and the environmental uh, context. Uh, and you want to to be able to monitor and measure that as well, and and, and have a security posture of, of all of all uh, associated assets. Because again, you don't want to to trust a device just because you know it's it's in your network and you know the device. You want to continuously monitor it and have perhaps something like device based conditional access. Um, and then it's important as well to be able to discover new devices. You know whether it's an IT or an OT or an IoT device or an asset. You want to be able to detect it. And, and, and then therefore also then be on the lookout for rogue devices. Um, and all resource authentication and authorization uh, are dynamic and strictly enforced before the access is allowed. And then finally, you want to collect as much information as possible about the state of these resources, you know, these assets, infrastructure and communications and, and continuously improve uh, that security posture. So uh, uh, <laughs> a bit like continuous integration and continuous you know, CICD, uh, but, but applied um, in IT and security. So why are we having a zero trust conversation then? So again, um, IT and OT security are complex and have uh, and, and quite different. Uh, initially, we looked more to trusted network as in uh, we used to accept lower security within the network. Um, and, I, and I can admit that I was guilty of that in my first security job where I, where, you know, I was more concerned about the external network and, um, you know, when doing external or internal pen testing. Yeah, it, it's quite interesting looking back because it's true that, yeah, just because something's internal doesn't mean that you can inherently trust it. You know, you want to be able to continuously verify it and double check and, and just have, uh, yeah, have security in place there. Um, and then of course, assets have increasingly been leaving the traditional corporate office network or, uh, you know, you've got bring your own devices. So you want to have a way to, to look at these devices. You know, if I use my personal PC, uh, my personal computer you know you want you want to know okay how um you know how can i trust that uh is this actually celine and so yeah we have to really think about it especially in the last couple of years and with the increase of working from home remote working increase of mobile use uh as well and kiosk devices uh in in, in different uh sectors as well uh, as well as uh, software as a service and then attackers uh, also have been shifting more to identity attacks. So whether these identities are users uh, or devices, um, they're shifting more towards identity attacks uh, rather than just the network. Um, so things like phishing and credential theft um, and security teams obviously are overwhelmed. So about the open group then, uh, so they've come up, so from the open group then, uh, yeah, and, and based on NIST as well, uh, they've come up with, with architecture um, uh, frameworks as well. Um, so really each identity should be verified and needs to be compliant, whether they're inside this grill or not. Because the classic approach was to restrict everything to a network and then and that's it. But actually instead with zero trust, you can, you can have that visibility and protect assets uh, anywhere. Um, with with a centralized policy, so wherever these assets are and whatever these assets, whichever different types of assets they are, you want to be able to, to to protect them that way. 
So I think this is one of the answers that someone put in the Mentimeter. Um, but yeah, so there are three key pillars with zero trust and that's to verify explicitly. So, so again, it means you wanna ensure that every access request is strongly authenticated and not inferred. You don't want to have the inferred trust that, oh yeah, it should be fine, right? You want secure security at the point of access, um, look at the contextual information and the conditional access. You know, is this a new IP address? Is this an impossible travel risk? You know, is Celine suddenly logging in from or, or is Denise, you know, suddenly logging in from California when they're in another country, you know, and, and that's never been seen before and it doesn't, and the time doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Um, you want to look as well at, at the device, uh, the device risk-based conditional access as well. Um, and then use strong authentication, use uh, MFA, and then even better uh, is to use passwordless. So passwordless is kind of a more recent concept in security, uh, but essentially it's having, it's kind of like MFA on steroids. So. <laughs> So it's really having multiple factors of authentication, but then getting rid of passwords. And why? Well, think when you think about it, if you don't have a password, then you can't um, um, be, be victim to a password spray attack, you know, because there are no passwords. So if you take away the password, you take away the tool that an attacker uses uh, need and needs for a password attack. So then that is one quick win to reduce that, that attack surface. Um, so using least privileges then, oh yeah, and going back to passwords, it's also the fact that passwords are, you know, are quite insecure, you know, they don't really prove anything, but, but anyway, so, so passwordless, I could go on for, for another hour and that it's quite, quite interesting. Um, so the second pillar then, so the second kind of main tenet is, is to use least privilege. Uh, that's another one that someone put in the word cloud. So that good job. <laughs> uh, so it's about, you only want to give the least access and the least privileges needed for someone to perform their basic functions, you know, for someone to do their job. Um, it, yeah, and I mean, I, I guess it just it just kind of goes without saying, right? You know, you, you don't want too many global admins in your in your tenants, or you don't want people to have access that they don't need. Um, and it's important as well, it, it, something that helps as well is to have risk-based adaptive policies and role-based access control. So control specifically around, around the role. Um, but at the same time, you don't want to restrict it too much and not let people be able to effectively do their job and and and, and have to annoy you know the, the admin and ask, oh, can you give me access to this? Can you change my can you change my role? You know, <laughs> it's quite annoying, right? So so really, how do you balance? How do you make things more efficient? And how do you balance productivity, efficiency, uh, and 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 just the, these operations? Well, you could do something like using just in time or just enough access. Uh, so what that does is it temporarily elevates and gives uh, enough access needed or and or just enough time to reduce risk and ensure that you don't give too much access permanently or by default. So for an example, uh, let's say I make a just-in-time access request. I verify with MFA that yes, this is me. Yes, I'm making that request. You know, you as an uh, as an admin maybe gave me made me eligible for a specific role privilege that I can that I can access only when I need to at a specific time, um, maybe just half, uh, half an hour. Um, and then that's it, and after the half hour, that's it. I don't have it anymore and I just have my normal role, you know, my normal user role. Uh, so that's, that's an example. Another example would be uh, to, give, um, to give temporary um, access needed to, to, to a VM or other workload when, when needed. And then of course to have visibility of when that was done, have auditing in place. You know, perform access reviews of who had access when, uh, what did they do, etc. And um, and then the third main tenet is to assume breach. So assume. Um, so if, if we go back to uh, to that um, when I mentioned that, so really, so really, what does assume breach mean? It might sound a bit cynical or negative, but but honestly, personally, when I came across this in my career, I I found it quite. It it kind of caused a, a shift in my mind of looking at the way I look at things in security. So assume breach is quite an interesting one. So it means it means essentially operating um, with the mindset that maybe I have already been compromised. Maybe our organization is compromised. But we just don't know it yet. Uh, and I'm sure that probably, you know, you probably have heard or probably know that when it comes to certain types of breaches, um, there have been cases where organizations didn't know that they were breached for months, even, you know, going into two, three, four months without or more without knowing they were breached. Uh, this is especially a case found in uh, advanced persistent threats, so APTs. 
which can often be caused by a nation state. Um, so a threat that persists uh, that persists in your in your states, uh, you know, in the background, but lays low and quiet, and that way it doesn't detect. Uh, it doesn't um, it doesn't ring any alarm bells, you know, in in, in a you know in, in certain tools that, that you've got in place. Uh, and, and so really, it's it's a threat that goes undetected for a long time, and and during that time, you know, perhaps moves laterally, um, exfiltrates data, pivots, and escalates privileges and such. Um, so it's really important to rather than think okay we haven't been breached as far as we know therefore we should be okay you know until we're told otherwise you know until we find out otherwise um it's it's better to to operate thinking what if i have already been breached but i don't know it yet okay what but it's empowering right because then it tells you what can i do now to ensure that i, I minimize the blast radius okay imagine we're compromised and we just don't know it yet what can we do and what can we have in place to, to monitor, to uh, detect, uh, to respond? You know, do you have an incident response plan? Do you have a disaster recovery plan in place? Do you have a way to uh, not only get alerts, but then also to automate response? Um, and, and But especially what can you put in, in, in the first place? What can you put down to minimize the attack surface and to minimize the blast radius if something were to happen? So for example, in, in the case of networking, uh, maybe use micro segmentation uh, or maybe isolate uh, legacy servers that you can't, you know, update, but just, you know, at least, at least lock them down so that if something happens, it doesn't spread everywhere. Um, and so the interesting thing about Zero Trust as well is that it is applicable to more than just a traditional network. So it's looking really across I all identities, uh, all endpoints, wherever they reside, looking at data as well. Um, you know, is the data secured at rest uh, and in transit? Do you have a way to automatically label and classify the data? Do you know what data you've got in place? Do you have data loss prevention? Uh, it's looking at applications and DevOps as well. Um, so for example, uh, even implementing uh, and looking at shifting left in DevOps, uh, looking at CICD, you know, what have you got in place to, to think about to design to develop with security in mind and not with security as an afterthought or as a, or, or bolted on and, and, and fit fitted in retroactively um and then looking at infrastructure as well whether that's your on-premises your multi-cloud workloads uh, a hybrid model you know any on on-prem uh, as well as uh, you know in the cloud um how do you reduce that attack service how do you empower people with just in time and just enough access uh and then networks as well so uh, do you have network controls in place and micro segmentation for an example and so now just the final part then um how do we put the two together because zero trust was traditionally more about it you know are there any differences and and how can you apply it uh in ot maybe a bit more specifically so 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 top of mind things to consider are what devices do we have you know in terms of it iot uh, operational technology um, are they all known? Uh, do you have a way to detect rogue devices? So a, a, an unknown device that suddenly connects to the network, do you have a way of knowing that, oh, wait a minute, we don't know that device, that's not, or that's not a managed device, you know, who, who has just connected to the network, you know, what is that? Um, how are these assets communicating to each other, you know, and are they communicating out to the public internet and, you know, who's, who's, where is the traffic flowing? Um, and can you implement better segmentation policies? Uh, and then also think about your continuous uh, IoT threat monitoring and incident response. Uh, think about implementing, yeah, looking at IoT and OT as part of your extended detection and response or as part of your security operations uh, and really as part of your security strategy. Um, and then when it comes to risk and vulnerability management as well, uh, it's, it's really important to know about what vulnerabilities uh, require your immediate attention. How can you prioritize how can you find out and, and, continue, can, and continuously find out when you have vulnerabilities in your OT and IoT estate as well? Um, and then unified OT and IoT security monitoring. Uh, so, so again, make it a part of your security operations. Um, you know, train staff, uh, train staff in OT, train staff in IT, uh, train your, 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 your SecOps team. You know, if you have a SecOps team or if you have uh, you know, a security team, train them in, in kind of recognizing and, and how, how you can work together and kind of reduce the historical silo between the two. And then of course, if you lack the staff for your own security operations team, you know, is it something that you can outsource? You know, can you find, you know, can you find a partner? Can you find someone that can help you with that? 
Um, so going back to the CISA and NSA advisory, so so they've so some of their recommendations around OT specifically is that um, that organization that organizations should create uh, and have you know a continuously updated uh, infrastructure map uh, and inventory list as well uh, to be able to investigate uh, any risks uh, to be able to also look look at vulnerabilities. Um, Within, within those assets and then to have that continuous and vigilant uh, that a system monitoring. So that continuous monitoring and anomaly detection in place. Um, something interesting too about zero trust maturity, uh, about zero trust is that uh, the CISA has also come out with a maturity model. So this is really to, kind of, to help organizations map out, identify where they are on that maturity journey. And, you know, it, it's kind of looking at what, what does, good, better, best to look like. So that's uh, traditional, what tends to be traditionally seen uh, across from identity, device, network, application workload, all the way up to uh, end data. Um, and then here's what's considered to be more advanced. So having um, some identity federation with cloud and on-prem systems, as an example, uh, least privileged controls. Um, and then, but optimally, um, and honestly, sometimes organizations will kind of be on in different points, depending on, on what, you know, not, you know, everyone is <laughs> perfectly across the board, really. Um, but looking at it optimally, this is what optimal looks like. So it's that continuous validation. Uh, it's leveraging machine learning, uh, behavioral analyst, uh, analysis, having that constant uh, monitoring and validation, um, looking at ingress and egress. So looking at what's what enters a network, what, what leaves a network. Um, when it comes to OT systems, maybe um, to OT uh, environments, perhaps, you know, do you have a way to not only isolate devices that need to be isolated, but do you have a way to, to block uh, egress or, well, to not block egress, but like to, do you have a way to make it so certain OT assets can't um, go out to the public internet, for example? Um, and Oh, I see I've got a question in the chat, so I'm just going to look. Uh, will slides be made available? Uh, yeah, I, I can share this. I, yeah, I'll look into, yeah, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Yeah. Okay, ZTN, the Trojan Network, actually. Yeah. yeah, okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, sorry, just looking at the, the, the comments about the slides. So yeah, um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll look at making the slides uh, available uh, afterwards. So, so just in summary then about zero trust for OT and IoT, uh, the key points, to, the key takeaways uh, would be visibility, so discovery and classification of what you've got, knowing what you've got, uh, looking at isolating when, when needed, uh, looking at static and dynamic controls, um, and then unifying uh, threat protection and response. So, so basically just applying the IT security and, and, and security operations, but to, to the OT and IoT. So some, some kind of, ways that you could, yeah, you, you could do this then is verify explicitly, uh, implement least privilege, uh, assume compromise, um, looking at the basic hygiene, basic security hygiene, uh, patch for possible, uh, implement MFA, uh, ensure that PLCs don't run uh, as root where not needed, uh, and, and also ensure that IoT device default passwords are changed, uh, ensure that there are no plain text passwords that can be found, um, implement continuous monitoring, um, detecting compromised devices with behavioral anomaly detection, rather than only looking at signature-based detections, you know, which, which are limited, uh, because when it comes to signature-based detection, uh, it, won't, it won't look, it, it won't be able to detect uh, a living off the land attack, for example, because a living off the land attack won't have a malware signature, you know, it'll be legitimate software. So you have to look at the behavioral as well, at, at the behavior of things. So from a behavioral anomaly um, point of view, uh, and then, you know, again, segmentation and network mapping, and then, and then really um, make this a part of your security operations, um, and, and also train, look at the social, um, social psychological aspect, you know, change management and, and, uh, and training employees and kind of and bridging the gap between teams and between um, roles. So, yeah, I was just conscious of time, I'm going to just... Um, just skip that that one. Um, so something interesting as well is when it comes to threat intelligence, um, 
so I think probably you probably know about the Mitre Tech framework. I've seen uh, I've seen other talks as part of the Open Security Summits around Mitre Tech, which is fantastic because I, I love Mitre Tech as well. I think it's I think it's really fantastic. Uh, it really helps uh, us as practitioners or, or anyone interested in security. It really helps to understand not only the tactics, as in the goals that threat actors, you know, uh, the, that threat actors try to reach, but also the techniques, you know. So, so specifically, how are these hackers attacking this? Um, you know, what are they exploiting? How are they doing it? And then being able to map that and, and look out for that uh, within within your um, your environment. Um, but what's really great and kind of not really well known is the fact that Mitre Tech, uh, there's actually a framework specifically tailored for industrial control systems because, you know, again, the techniques are a little bit different as well as some of the tactics, you know, because some of the end goals might be different, like the cyber physical and, and uh, that safety aspect. Um, so, yeah, so I, I'll just invite you if you're interested, you can look that up, just, just Google Mitre Tech uh, for ICS as an example or, or, or follow that link and um, yeah, you'll be able to read more about that. But what's really what's really great is that you can actually even utilize that as part of threat modeling. Um, you can also benefit from, from some IoT and OT specific threat intelligence feeds that if you have security solutions in place um, uh, where you're use, utilizing threat intelligence feeds, you can look at, 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 trying, at implementing some OT specific uh, TI feeds. Uh, so here's an example of a zero trust architecture that was designed by Deloitte. Uh, so they had uh, designed that specifically for um, organizations that have a mixture of IT and OT. Uh, so looking at it from the architecture and governance, um, uh, looking at uh, network security as well. So for example, segregation through unidirectional gateway. So meaning um, blocking IT traffic, the IT traffic to the OT where needed, you know, making it so that it's one direction and not both, that it can't speak, go out in both directions. Uh, and then micro segments to so divide the network into small zones with separate access. So micro segmentation is really important because it means if a part of the network is is, is affected, it's not going to spread. Uh, it's not going to automatically spread to all the rest of it. Well, it, it'll it'll really greatly reduce that. Um, and then um, looking at um, environment isolation through, through centralized policy and least privileged access, uh, remote access through VPN, but also using conditional access. Um, because again, you know, a VPN is not, it's not enough anymore. You know, it's not enough to just have a VPN. Uh, and then also looking at real-time monitoring. So, um, because again, it, it's, it's good to have, to have as much prevention in place as possible and to minimize the blast radius, but then you also have to think about uh, not only monitoring and, and doing an, an analytics of it, but also do you have a way to, to manage, do you have a way to ingest all those logs and manage all of that uh, and, and do analytics on that. Uh, do you have a way to, uh, especially to orchestrate and automate response, you know, which will greatly uh, also reduce, um, it, it will really make your security operations more efficient and quicker to respond as well. And, and to be able to secure yourself uh, quicker in, in the event of, 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 yeah, of anything happening or, or any alerts that you get. Um, you can look at intrusion detection systems as well, uh, particular, that are specific for OT and IoT. Uh, vulnerability detection and behavioral analytics as well. Um, and yeah, and in terms of when we think about the people aspect of it too, it's important to to try to remove that that silo between IT and OT. So you can try to you can try to even see if you can send IT people to spend some time in the plants. That's if you know if 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 you are in uh, the type of, organ of organization that has an OT uh, environment. Um, or to learn about IoT devices and, and to, to do some security assessments of the IoT devices or OT devices, um, send OT people to spend time in the SOC, so to spend time with the security team, uh, try to do some, some mind share and, 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 and try, try to get on, be on the same page and, and, and increase those, those skills as well. Uh, and um, yeah, and ensure that you have ongoing communications between teams and between, between people that have different roles. Um, because at the end of the day, we all have the same goal. You know, we want to uh, secure society, secure people, <laughs> secure uh, critical national infrastructure, and 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 support support business, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then this way you can then help uh, OT to address uh, their own kind of operational and legacy issues uh, or networking issues. And yeah, I, that's that's it for me. Um, any, I don't know if anyone has any other questions or, or any other feedback.
No, really good. Go on, Alice. Ask, ask a question, Ari. I was, you should be able to unmute, or is that, is that just a, a high five? It looked like a, a hand up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really good presentation. I really like, and, and then I think what's interesting is there's a lot of these principles. I know it's just about OT, right? Or IoT, right? They, they're really good principles in, in general. Can you hear me, Dennis? Yeah, now we can hear you. Oh, sorry. I, I thought like. Uh... I was muted, so I apologize. I uh, just want to say great presentation. I was, I did a couple of sessions before on valid security and security on autonomous system. Uh, one of the hardest thing, you know, on IoT, as an example, is that, you know, uh, these big firms, they invest little in security. And what they do is um, they, they, they kind of, you know, um, give that security bit to a third party to deal with. And the other thing is we don't have enough data, but I want to say on what I want to say on the um, zero trust networks, one of the big disadvantages at the moment, just for now, is most of businesses, they have that hybrid environment and maybe their environment are not like, um, it's really hard to enable, like, you know, to, to get ZT, um, like, you know, zero trust to, as an example, to replace VPN because of, you know, the cost and, you know, they're going to need to change a lot of things uh, to do it so if you are aware on the cloud already or just cloud operating business it is it will be it will be easier to um to implement um but i mean I, i'm pretty sure that very very soon that you know uh, as um, a zero trust network will will definitely replace the uh, you know the you know traditional network network access um you know there are some couple of disadvantages at the moment let's say if i am a developer working on different data lakes it's really hard to switch and you know to have you know if you have multiple roles and stuff like that but amazing presentation thank you very much thank you thank you Alex. and yeah thanks for your thoughts that's a really good point and yeah i, I agree i think yeah, zero trust yeah and that's definitely definitely yeah superior and, and it's good to see you know, all those have been coming man you got you got some lovely comments building presentation by you too great overview all delivered by Sean. Yeah, brilliant by right right now. Good stuff. All right. I'm not sure we have any more questions. So, you know, thanks. Thanks for presenting. And I hope you come back and present again. And and if you're out on Friday, you pop into the, the sessions. Oh yeah. And then we'll do. Thank you so right. much. Thank you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Oops.